Now, let me tell you why I want to preach a series on the Enneagram. I don't care about the Enneagram. I don't care at all. I mean, I had somebody this week direct message me, Pastor, do you know that the Enneagram may be witchcraft? I'm like, oh my gosh, you know what? I, I, read a, I wrote a book about it and I didn't, I didn't discover that. I'm like, all these experts, right? Thank you so much for your wisdom. Listen to me. I, I don't wanna defend the Enneagram. I don't care about the Enneagram. Listen to me, I care about you. And if you are listening to, to me today and you know somebody who's a four, you love a four, you're raising a four, you're friends with a four, you better care about the Enneagram because listen to me, they got a red X on their back and the lions are coming from them. And you see the rest of us, we fit in with the herd. We fit in with the herd and we can act like the herd and we can blend in with the herd and we can just literally be safe in the herd. The fours have an X and the lions are coming. And here's what religion does. Religion says difference is always demonic. And so when your little kid doesn't fit in with the way the church thinks that they should be, they get killed, just like Jesus. He didn't fit in with all the other religious kids. He was very, very different. And so I just want you to know, Forrest, I'm sorry the church is the way it is. I'm sorry we haven't made room for you. I'm sorry we haven't seen your uniqueness, but I want you to know that God does and God loves you and God cares for you. And the rest of us, man, we need to repent today and say, God, we need to stop making them like us and the herd needs to come around and protect them because they're beautiful and they're amazing and they're incredible and they will make our lives better. It's very, it stands out. So as an individualist, I think, the beauty is that I'm able to connect with people on a deeper level. When it comes to hanging out with me, it's never, oh, let's go to Disneyland. It's always like, hey, let's have a talk. And then you know, two, three hours pass by and we've had this really deep talk and they're like, man, that was great. You know, and I'm like, yes, that's what I live for. The brokenness that I experienced for sure has always been like, am I good enough? I, I always go back to that one simple verse, right? Jesus wept. Jesus is the man. He's the king. He's the Lord of all, our savior. And if he can cry, and he can sit in those emotions and, and express those, then, then so can I. Who Jesus says we are is who we are. That's the truth. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made as an individualist, and there's only one me, and I'm thankful for that. Hey guys, welcome to a series called You. Man, I hope God is blessing you. I hope God is challenging you. I hope God is working in you. Man, a couple of years ago, I had an opportunity to visit one of our families serving God in Africa. I never thought in my wildest dreams I would go to Africa, but that's the thing about God. You have no idea where God wants to take you once you start following him. And so these missionaries that were serving in Africa, they said, hey, do you wanna go on a safari? And I was like, well, no, not really. You know, I've been to the zoo, amen? I mean, who's been to the zoo, right? I've been to the California Zoo. Let me tell you something. I don't know what's wrong with our zoo animals in California, but they do not look anything like the wild ones in Africa. I mean, our lions are like pathetic. They're like, yeah, I think I'll, they're like vegetarian or something. I don't know what the deal is, but we went on this safari and one of the first animals that just blew my mind, and I kid you not, I was blown away was by the zebra. I never thought I would care about the zebra. I never thought I would look at the zebra. But the first thing that drew my attention to the zebra was its butt. Okay? I, now, now, I love a good steak. I love a good steak. But I've never looked at a cow and went, mmm. Mmm. But I looked at that zebra's booty. And I was like, I was like, now I understand the lions. Now I understand I under, you see that running across Africa, you're like, mm -hmm, I'm gonna go get a bite of that. <laughs> but I mean, it's like, the, it's like a rump roast made by Jesus, man. It was just, it's incredible. And, and so then I thought, you know, have you ever found yourself being critical of God? Come on, ones, amen, amen. And I was like, Lord, why would you make such a tasty looking treat with such terrible camouflage? I mean, the poor zebra, right? It can hide nowhere. It's like, I see you. I still see you. I still, he's dressed like a ref, okay? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just like, I see you. And it, it really bothered me because the poor thing, I mean, it looks very tasty when you see it. Uh, very, very just muscular and just, 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 I mean, it looks, it looks good. I've never wanted a horse before, but that zebra looked good. And I was like, Lord, why on earth? Why on earth would you design the zebra this way? And here's what I found out. 
A zebra is not camouflaged against its background. That's not its weapon of camouflage. A zebra is camouflaged in the herd. And so when zebras are in a herd, they're, they're together, they actually create this camouflage where the lion cannot pick out which one it wants to eat. So listen to me very carefully. The lion has to identify which animal it's chasing. Otherwise, when you run, you're, you're just going everywhere and you catch nothing. They've actually done studies on zebras. Now, I don't know who these evil people are, probably professors at universities. <laughs> but what they did is they, they spray painted a red X on the back of a zebra and that one gets killed in one day every time. As soon as it is identified as being different from the herd, it dies. Now, let me tell you why I want to preach a series on the Enneagram. I don't care about the Enneagram. I don't care at all. I mean, I had somebody this week direct message me, Pastor, do you know that the Enneagram may be witchcraft? I'm like, oh my gosh, you know what? I, I, read a, I wrote a book about it and I didn't, I didn't discover that. I'm like, all these experts, right? Thank you so much for your wisdom. Listen to me. I, I don't want to defend the Enneagram. I don't care about the Enneagram. Listen to me, I care about you. And if you are listening to, to me today and you know somebody who's a four, you love a four, you're raising a four. You're friends with a four. You better care about the Enneagram because listen to me, they got a red X on their back and the lions are coming from them. And you see the rest of us, we fit in with the herd. We fit in with the herd and we can act like the herd and we can blend in with the herd and we can just literally be safe in the herd. The fours have an X and the lions are coming. And here's what religion does. Religion says difference is always demonic. And so when your little kid doesn't fit in with the way the church thinks that they should be, they get killed, just like Jesus. He didn't fit in with all the other religious kids. He was very, very different. And so I just want you to know, Forrest, I'm sorry the church is the way it is. I'm sorry we haven't made room for you. I'm sorry we haven't seen your uniqueness, but I want you to know that God does and God loves you and God cares for you. And the rest of us, man, we need to repent today and say, God, we need to stop making them like us and the herd needs to come around and protect them because they're beautiful and they're amazing and they're incredible and they will make our lives better. And so today we're gonna look at my favorite four in the Bible. He's one of the most overlooked individuals in the Bible, but one of the most incredible individuals in the Bible. His name is King Saul. Listen to me, fours. You may be overlooked by others for leadership, but when God chose his first king, he picked a four. He picked a four. And the last person that would have thought he would be picked, it's always the four. They're like, no, yeah, as soon as you start voting, they're like, nope. And that's exactly what Saul does. So later, Samuel called all the people of Israel to meet before the Lord at Mizpah. Now, I can't get into why all of this matters. It's in the book and, you know, I'm just, there's just some things I can cover in the book that I can't cover here, but this is an important place and this is an important time in Israel's history. God never does things by accident. He's always on purpose to bring about his purpose. And so Lord, the Lord is at Mizpah and he said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel has declared. Listen to me, Forrest, he's declared this. He says, I brought you from Egypt and I rescued you from the Egyptians and from all the nations that were oppressing you. But though I have rescued you from your misery and distress, you have rejected your God today and you have said, no, we want a king instead. Now therefore present yourselves before the Lord by tribes and clans. And so Samuel, the high priest of Israel, brought all the tribes of Israel before the Lord. And the tribe of Benjamin was chosen by Lot. The tribe of Benjamin is the smallest tribe. They were almost exterminated years earlier by the other 11 tribes, almost wiped off the face of the earth. And then they brought each family of the tribe of Benjamin before the Lord. So we got the smallest tribe and then we're gonna get the smallest family and God's gonna find his four. And the family of the Metrites was chosen and finally Saul, son of Kish, was chosen from among them. Listen to me, fours. But when they look for him, he's a four, he's gone. 
He's gone. I don't want to be in charge. I don't want the attention. I don't want anyone looking at me. And so they had to ask God, God, you picked our king, but he left. And by the way, those are the politicians we need to elect. Not the ones that run, but the ones that run from it. We need to all be afraid if somebody's like, you know what, I humbly suggest that you all should follow me. We need to start electing the people like, I ain't running. Nope, 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 nope. Don't want it, can't wait to get out of here, never want to run again, amen? That's who we want in charge. And that's who God picked. Isn't that amazing? God picked the one guy who didn't want the job. Can you imagine all the other guys? Who do you think is going to get it today? (laughs) I did come in first at the track meet this Thursday. You know what I'm saying? Can can you imagine all the guys? I mean, they had in their mind, you know, I I, I think I know who's going to get it. I think I know who's going to get it. Nobody picked Saul. Where is he? And the Lord replied, he is hiding amongst the baggage. Oh, fours, I love you. (laughs) You feel so at home in baggage, don't you? Because all you see is what's wrong and you fail to see what God has made is so right. And so they found him and they brought him out. And he stood head and shoulders above everyone else. Now I love our Jewish brothers and sisters. Not a lot of NBA players are Jewish. (laughs) Okay, they do great in synchronized swimming, powerhouse. Nation of Israel, powerhouse in synchronized swimming. Basketball, they're giving it their best shot. <laughs> so when you got a tall Jewish guy, right? It's, whoa, hey, hey, look at this guy. This guy can lead us. How is it that we never saw you? Isn't that amazing, fours? The world never sees you, but God always does. And then Samuel said to all the people, this is the man the Lord has chosen as your king, and no one in Israel is like him. And listen to me, fours, no one is like you. No one is like you. And it's why the lion comes for you. And all the people shouted, long live the king. Long live the king. I knew it. I knew it was Saul. I knew it. (laughs) You didn't know it. So we're going to talk today about the individualist. We're going to talk about the rarest type on the Enneagram. And listen to me, parents, if you're raising a four, your kid is never going to be like everyone else because God hasn't called them to be anyone else. God has called them to be them. And let me just say this. Many of us, we don't know what the word means in John 3, 16 when it says Jesus is God's one and only begotten son. It means he is the uniquest son who ever lived. And fours, that's what you bring out. You bring out the begottenness of God, the unique creativity of God. That's you. And just own it. You're a little different. And that's okay because the rest of us are boring, amen? (laughs) We're boring. The individualist reflects God's uniqueness. We're gonna talk a lot today about the word holy. Many of us, we were taught the word holy means perfection. It means unique set apart, not like anyone or anything else. Holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He is not what you think. Exodus 9, 13 through 14, then the Lord said to Moses, there was no one like me in all the earth. That's what God says. That's why so many religions are wrong. They look to understand God based upon the things around them. And so they think God is big like a mountain or powerful like the waves or tall like the trees. And God says, I am holy, holy, holy. He is separate and outside of what we can see. And fours reflect that. They reflect that. Stop waiting them for them to be like us. They're not called to be like us. They're called to be like God and reflect his uniqueness. And so for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about shame. The underlying emotion of the two. The two says, if I just cover my shame with works, people will love me. The three says, if I just cover my shame with success, people will notice me. And the four says, if I'm just more different than everyone else, people will finally see and appreciate me and my shame will be covered. And some are like, well, pastor, I don't know why you're talking so much about shame. 
Do you know the Bible talks about shame 161 times? 161 times. The first emotion that Adam and Eve felt when they sinned was shame. And only, only, only Jesus can take away your shame. And so what the four feels is they are ashamed of being or feeling ordinary. You know what's so sad for us? You're not. You're not. And that's why the gospel is so important. Some of you say, well, pastor, just preach the gospel. Here it is. Here it is. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him, who? The unique one, the begotten one, the forest of all fours. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. And so what drives the four? What wakes the four up in the morning? It's significance. I wanna be significant. I wanna have an impact. Okay, when your four goes off to college, they don't pick the degree that pays the most. They pick the degree that's gonna make them feel the most significant. What am I gonna do? That's if they wanna go to college. They might wanna go on a world tour to find themselves. <laughs> to make clothing out of camel hair, right? You know, I mean, seriously, to, to drink coffee that no one has ever drunk before. <laughs> from a land that no one has ever been before. That's a four. They're not gonna drink at Starbucks, that's the devil. <laughs> and they may be right, amen? They may be right. Unless, of course, you work at Starbucks, we appreciate your generosity. <laughs> Thank you. That's my three, that's my three. In 1 Samuel 14, 47 through 48, it says this. Now when Saul had secured his grasp on Israel's throne, listen to this, he fought against his enemies in every direction. Listen to this, fours. He performed great deeds, saving Israel from all those who had plundered them. He was great. He was amazing. He was incredible. The core need of the four is to be unique, and Saul was. Saul was. What breaks my heart for Saul is that he never realized how much he was loved. He never embraced how much the people appreciated him. He was a great leader. He defended his people. He protected his people. But he never saw it. He could never see himself forced because he was always focused on others. Listen to me, fours. I want you to hear this. There's another four in the Bible. His name is Jeremiah. He's known as the weeping prophet. Four is your emotional. It just is, right? I mean, your emotions are like seasons. You're up, you're down, you're in, you're out, you're bawling. <laughs> this is the way it goes. You leak. It's okay. It's okay. Some of you guys are like, what is this? Huh. You're probably an eight. That's, that's it's a tear, you know. <laughs> now, the word of the Lord came to me saying, listen to what Jeremiah, a four, hears from the Lord. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. You see what the four says is nobody gets me, nobody sees me, nobody knows me, and God tells Jeremiah, a four, I knew you. Before you knew yourself, I knew you. Listen to this, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I chose you and appointed you to be a prophet to the nations. Isn't it an amazing force? You keep running from your calling. But God is calling. God is calling. You know why fours make great leaders? They don't want the attention. And those are the best leaders. The scariest leaders are the ones like, look at me. Have you seen what I can do? It's terrifying. Fours, avoid being basic. My whole life as an unhealthy three, I've always been about the labels. A four will cut the label off. I'm not wearing that, we're going to a thrift store. If my parents made me go to a thrift store, I would have died inside as a child. <laughs> I don't wanna dress like grandpa and I don't wanna smell like grandpa. <laughs> Fours are like vintage. Can you believe I got this for a dollar? Yeah, I... 
Yeah, I, I can. <laughs> but that's the way fours are. They want to be different. They're, they're different than the rest of us. They don't care about labels. They despise them. And it isn't interesting that God chose to label Saul king because he was someone who hated labels. Isn't that incredible? God, God knows what he's doing. But here's the challenge of a four. A four focuses on what's missing. What's missing? For all of Saul's accomplishments, he missed celebrating them. And he was constantly comparing himself to someone else. The thing that breaks my heart for Saul is all he could see was David. And he spent his life loathing David and hating David. And he missed out on being Saul. Fours, don't be anybody else. We're boring. You're fun. You're great. You're beautiful. You're incredible. You connect us to the very heart and the emotional center of God. The shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. God feels with us. The thing I love about fours is they're so different than the rest of us, right? We, we all freaked out this week because Instagram went down. Some of you are like, I knew it. Jesus is coming. I knew it. This is it, Lord. Facebook is down. I see your face, Lord. You see all of us as the other numbers. We know when Facebook goes down, but a four can see when someone else's face goes down. They can see us. They can see that we're hurting. Listen to me. They're drawn to our pain. They're drawn to that. They want to sit with us in that. I don't want to be with myself when I feel like crap. Fours are like, let's do this together. <laughs> let's feel this. I'm an unhealthy three. I'm like, feel what? They're like, that. <laughs> it's incredible. But here's your core sin, fours. Envy. Do you know that the reason the Bible says that the leaders of Israel killed Jesus, it says that they were envious of him. Don't let that get the best of you. The reason Saul hated David was because he was envious. He was envious. Envy will rob you of the joy of being yourself. Here's the fear of the four, being unnoticed. Being unnoticed. Listen, listen to Saul's authenticity. This was their song. Saul has killed thousands but David, his 10,000s. And this made Saul very angry. Where does the four go in unhealth? To the one. What is the core sin of the one? Anger. Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his 10,000s. Oh my gosh, that unique person got a thousand likes. I only got a hundred likes. They gotta die right now, Lord Jesus. You see, here's the problem if you're a four today is you live in a world where all the fours are on the internet now. And instead of celebrating them, you're jealous and envious of them. What's so sad for Saul is he was never called to be David. He was hand-picked to be king, to be king. Fours, you're not called to be anybody else. You're called to be you. David is 10,000s, and this made Saul very, very angry. What is this he said? They credit David with 10,000s and me only 1,000? I only got 1,000 likes. They got 10,000 likes. I only got 1,000 followers. They got 10,000 followers. He's got to die. Listen to what he says. Next, they'll be making him king. Listen to me, Saul. Only God makes the king. Only God makes the king. One of the things that I've had to work on, I'm a three wing four, is when I'm not preaching, I wanna make sure that we have the best people up here on stage, preaching and speaking and communicating. And here's why, with some people, we get one shot with the gospel with them. And I don't want somebody on stage who can't speak to speak to them about Jesus. And here's why I can do that. Not because I'm confident, but I'm confident in this, that Jesus made me the pastor of this church. And when my time is done, Jesus will remove me. He makes the king. He makes the pastor. He calls. 
If my security is in you guys, I'm doomed. My security is in Jesus. And that's what you have to do for us. I don't have to be anyone else but who Jesus is calling me to be. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David when he should have kept a humble eye on God. We all need this. Feel the feels, but follow Jesus. So if you're for today, how can you be real with yourself? Psalms 119, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. Don't focus on your flaws. Focus on what God has done. How wonderful is your workmanship. God's made you. God's called you. God's designed you to be you. Listen to me, for us on judgment day. Jesus is gonna say, all I ever asked you to be was you. Not them. You. And here's what Jesus is gonna say, and I loved what I made. Here's the transformation to embrace, it's gratitude. Force focus on what's missing what they didn't get right, what didn't happen, what's not going on right. Here's what the author of Hebrews says, therefore let us be grateful, right? Let us be grateful. Let's work for an attitude of gratitude. Let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. Some of you came to church today and you're grateful for nothing. You're mad at God. Well, you're gonna miss out on worship and you're probably gonna miss out on this message. You say, what has the Lord done for me today? You woke up. One of my favorite Johnny Cash lines is, what do you consider paradise? You know what his answer was? Waking up this morning. Truly a prophet, a gifted four. (laughs) Incredible guy. But listen to me, fours. Johnny Cash's last song was called My Pile of Dirt. As I was in the Johnny Cash Museum in Nashville, Tennessee, I just wept as he lamented over his wasted life. He built a pile of dirt. Oh, and it was an expensive pile of dirt. But he blew it. And he really came back to the end of his life, to his calling to his God, to his Jesus. And what he lamented at the end of his life was that he didn't serve Jesus his entire life. That's what he missed. As a rock star who lived a rock star life is saying, I missed my calling. My calling to follow you, God, instead of building my pile of dirt. How can an individualist be real with others? Learn to see the beauty and talent in others as a good thing. As a good thing. 1 Samuel 14, 52 says this, the conflict with the Philistines was fierce and all of Saul's days. So whenever Saul noticed a strong or brave man, he enlisted him. He wasn't intimidated by him. He didn't kill him. He didn't run him off. He enlisted him. So if somebody is more talented, if somebody is more beautiful, if someone is more gifted, praise God, we worship a God who gives beauty to many people and talent to many people. We worship a generous God. And don't let Satan rob you of the joy of appreciating that beauty because Satan will say, he should have given it to you. But we worship a generous God who gives it to everyone. And he blesses everyone. It's okay when you become healthy to notice beauty, to notice talent, to notice uniqueness. Instead of walking in the mall, hate her, hate her, hate her, hate her. (laughs) Notice beauty. Notice that. It's okay. Celebrate it. And that's what happens in churches. Man, if somebody can sing better, celebrate it. Celebrate it. I praise God there are people in this church that can sing better than me. Can you imagine? Worship, 
would be rough. It would be rough. I mean, the Holy Spirit would look at Jesus. I can't even, I can't even work with that. I don't. Like, we love him. You know, Matt's our guy. He's on our team. But Ed, that's terrible. It's terrible. <laughs> Psalms 8, 4 through 5. Listen to this. What is man that thou art mindful of him? For thou hast made him just a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. That's the King James Version. There's some people out there who don't think I know that translation exists. I do. You're welcome. But let me tell you why I'm quoting the King James Version. Because it's a version translated on manuscripts that aren't as old as the ones that we currently have. And so when King James authorized that translation to be written, they came to those words. He created them little lower than the angels. But you know, we've uncovered the Hebrew manuscripts and the word isn't angel. He created you, listen to me, a little lower and the word is Elohim. Listen to me, fours, you're not a little lower than an angel. You're a lot above an angel. You're a little lower than God. You have no idea. You have no idea how incredibly amazing you are. And, and, and literally, when people translate that word Elohim, go, pick any translation you want. They don't know what to do with it because we all feel like we have to be, we're so humble, we have to deny what the word of God says. That's how demented we are. The word of God says that I created you just a little lower than me. And so some of your translations will say heavenly beings. Some will say angels. They don't know what to do. The word is Elohim. That's why the apostle Paul says, don't you know, brothers and sisters, that one day you will judge angels? You have no idea who you are. Stop worrying about what everyone else is and say, God, would you just show me who you've called me to be? Would you just show me? Show me what you've called me to be. And so many human beings today, you are living in the image of animals rather than the one who made animals. God created you not to be a beast, but to be a blessing to this earth. So start living like it. Next, how can the individuals be real with God? First Samuel 13, eight through nine, Saul waited there seven days for Samuel. As Samuel had instructed him earlier, but Samuel still didn't come. Saul realized that his troops were rapidly slipping away. And so he demanded, he said, bring me the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And so Saul sacrificed a burnt offering himself. In the Old Testament, there are three, there are three offices. There's prophet, there's priest, and there's king. Here's what you need to know about Saul. He held two of those offices. He was a king and he prophesied, but he was not a priest. There is only one person in the scripture who holds all three offices and his name is Jesus. He is our high prophet, he is our high priest, and he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. But here's what happened to Saul. He couldn't wait for Samuel. He started to freak out. He started to worry. He started to think these people who are called by God to follow me, who's called me to be their king, aren't gonna follow me. And he listened to his emotions and he forgot his faith. And so he hurriedly sacrificed to God as a high priest. And it was in that moment that God said, I gotta get another king. Listen to me, fours, feel your emotions, but follow your faith. Follow your faith. Follow your faith. Too many of us who identify with the four style, we doubt our beliefs and we believe our doubts. Believe your beliefs and doubt your doubts. So if you've got somebody in your life that's a four, man, God has given you a special gift. You have a holy and anointed commission to care for them and guide them and protect them from the lions because they will come. They will come and they will say, conform 
They will say, get in line. And you need to say, God hasn't called them to get in line. He's called them to create their own line. So how to love an individualist. Number one, don't ever put them in a box. They hate a box, okay? Like they feel like you put them in a box when you ask them to design a box. They're like, oh my gosh, this is affecting my creativity. (laughs) Right? Don't put them in a box. You constantly have to make room for them. They have to be able to express. You know, you wanna kill a four, put them in a cubicle. They're like, oh, I would rather die. Next, enjoy and appreciate how deeply they feel. A four is like a roller coaster made by Jesus. You're like, oh, we're gonna die. Oh, that was so fun. Oh, we're gonna die. Oh, that was so fun. Yes. It's incredible. It's incredible. Some of you guys in worship, you're like looking at people, they're sobbing, their hands are lifted, they're crying, they're on the ground, they're rolling. That's a four. (laughs) Some of you are like, I don't don't get it. You know what? You're probably a five. We'll get to you next week. It's okay. But some of you guys, you know, you're saying, why, why, don't, why, don't they, why are they acting that way? That's how God made them. They feel their feels. They were born to understand and identify with the very heart and emotional center of God. Next, point out how their uniqueness has blessed you. One of the reasons I wanted to create a church that was real with ourselves, God, and others is so that we could leave room for people who, who listen and feel the beat of a different drum. So many churches today reject fours because of their creativity, because of their emotion, because of their desire. Listen to these words to actually live out scripture and write a new song. I mean, I'm all for the old songs, but has God done nothing in 200 years that would cause us to sing a new song? (laughs) And, And people look at us because God did something this week that generated something and they think there's something wrong with us. If you're singing the same song, you know, 99 beers on the wall, second verse, same as the first. Maybe we need a fresh movement of God. There's nothing wrong with the old songs. Let's sing those in a new way to a new generation that loves Jesus. Next, challenge fours. Challenge them to feel, but not to be led by feelings. Feelings are great to feel, terrible to follow. Don't follow them. As a, as a three-wing four man, every single week I preach to you guys, I'm like, oh man, I think that was good. I think that was good. And I drive down Palm Reed and I'm like, I'm terrible at this, I'm terrible at this. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. It's awful. <laughs> Why did I say that? And that's just the way it is. You've got to learn to deal with those low points and trust that God is gonna do something Listen to me, fours, you're not responsible for the results, but you are responsible for your effort. And bring it forward and say, here's what I wanna do. And like I said before, man, if you have a four in your life, enjoy the ride. Enjoy the ride. It's incredible. I appreciate them so much. And they provide such vibrancy to our church. A couple of months ago, Tammy and I were in Idaho experiencing some much needed rest and our worship team wrote this song. And it's very simple, but it was profound. And every now and then, you'll hear a song where you hear God, you feel God. And I didn't even get to be in worship during this song. I, I watched it and witnessed it on Instagram. Isn't that amazing? God can use Instagram. Maybe he can use the Enneagram. Maybe. Pray about it. But here was the song. Holy are you, Lord God Almighty. Holy are you, Lord. 
I instantly emailed one of our worship leaders and I said, can I please have that song? And I played it on repeat in my car and I wept. I wept at the simple words, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. I felt like I was singing with the angels. I felt the spirit of God. A song written and sung by a four took me to the throne of God's heart. And I wept while my wife was in Target, because that's hell. (laughs) I'm not going in. And I just sat in my car on repeat, the words over and over and over again, holy are you, Lord, holy are you, Lord, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. And I just wept and I went home and I got on my computer because I wanted to read it in Hebrew. I wanted to hear what it sounded like in Hebrew. And I wanted to look for those exact words. Holy are you, Lord, God Almighty. And so I researched the Hebrew from Genesis to the last minor prophet. And what I found, I will never forget. Listen to me, fours. I couldn't find the words exactly. Holy are you, Lord. But here's what I did find. I found these words, Atem Kodesh the Yahweh. And what that means is, holy are you to the Lord. We sing to the Lord, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. And the Holy Spirit in heaven sings to us, holy are you to me. Holy are you to me, Atem Kodesh Le Yahweh. You fours are holy unto him. And he loves you. He loves you. Think about that the next time we're in worship and ask the Holy Spirit, what are you singing about me from heaven? You are mine, says the Lord, and you are holy to me, precious. Don't be anyone else. Let me pray for you. God, let me feel my emotions, but let me follow your instructions. God, as a church, let us repent for trying to make fours anything but what you've called them to be. They are beautiful, wonderful, amazing creations of God. And historically, they have had a hard time in the church. And we have driven their creativity. We have driven their inspiration into the world away from you, the one who gave them that beauty. Let us as a church, God, open our arms to our creative, emotionally centered friends. And I pray, God, that their beauty would reflect your beauty that is in heaven. And Father, I pray for every four right now that they would be convicted by the power of your Holy Spirit and that they would know that you created them to be holy unto you and to reflect your heart and your passion and your creativity. Lord, help them to know right now that they are a blessing and that they are beautiful just the way they are. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.